the Lieutenant Governor. It is the wish of her honor, the Lieutenant Governor, that the ladies and gentlemen be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. I am the Speaker of the House of Assembly, Gordon Goss. Welcome to the 25th Annual Treaty Day Celebrations and Awards Ceremony. It's my distinct pleasure to chair this afternoon's event. First, I would like to call upon Elder Noel Knockwood to perform the opening ceremony. Please pray along with me with the God of your understanding. Quay, Salmo, Chiniscam, Gilna Eaptuski Dinuin, Akinum Sikoino Jodeman, Elta Multiag Nega Gedo Chitpiskwan, and last it Hamodan Nel Nenemek, and Oberon Mudestan. Salmo Chiniscam Gedu Nagilum Sikoi Nestaman, Gedo Ekik Skidino, who Nestamid Mikamavi took now to Aglansevich to Colossa de Madis. O great spirit, who art before all else, and who dwells in every object, and in every person and in every place, we call on to thee. We summon thee from the far places of the present awareness. <coughs> Grandfather, Grandmother God, you are the ultimate force that created this universe and all life within. And to many spirits you have given to live upon this earth, and to each you have instructed on how to live according to your ways. As we came from the womb of our mother, the earth, you gave us life. Then you have given me and my people many sacred objects from which it would learn from our relatives, the winged, the two-legged, the four-legged, and those that live in the waters and that dwell in the air to walk a wood path. Grandfather, you have made the races of the world, the red, the yellow, the black, and the white people. And to each you have given a domain and a purpose. And today, as the red stands before the yellow, black, and white, I pray that you will enter into their hearts so that they, they can understand our purpose. And as one body, one spirit, and one voice, we offer you our prayers. El me yak sabono ke slavolono ke lak me gure la motes taho Thank you I would now like to call upon Ian Gray Regional Director General Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada to provide remarks Thank you Mr Speaker her Honor, Lieutenant Governor, Premier Dexter, National Chief Atlio, National uh, Regional Chief Gugu, Elders, Chiefs, Grand Chief Silliboy, Grand Captain Denny, Councillors, members of the Nova Scotia Legislature, community members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is always a personal honor for me to participate in Mi'kmaq Treaty Day. I am delighted to once again be here on behalf of Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada and to be a part of the 25th anniversary celebrations today. At this time, it's my pleasure to read a statement from the Honourable John Duncan, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development, and I quote, 
On behalf of the Government of Canada, it is a great pleasure to recognize and celebrate the 25th anniversary of Mi'kmaq Treaty Day in Nova Scotia. Mi'kmaq Treaty Day provides a good opportunity for the Government of Canada to celebrate our continuing and unique relationship with the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia through commemoration of the Peace and Friendship Treaties signed in the 1700s. The contributions of the Mi'kmaq to the making of this country are many, and all Mi'kmaq can be proud as we celebrate on this important day. In 1986, October 1st was proclaimed as Treaty Day with the signing of a proclamation by then Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. to commemorate the relationship between the Mi'kmaq and the Crown. Treaties are solemn agreements that set out promises, obligations, and benefits for both parties. The continuing treaty relationship provides a context of mutual rights and responsibilities that will ensure Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people can together enjoy Canada's benefit." End of quote. I would like to personally congratulate each of you who will receive an award today. You are shining light and serve as a positive role models for your communities and for all of us here today. Thank you. Will Allen. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to call upon Premier Daryl Dexter to provide his remarks. Thank you. On behalf of the Government of Nova Scotia, I would like to welcome everyone here today to the annual Mi'kmaq Treaty Day celebrations. I'm honoured to welcome Grand Chief Celeboy, Grand Captain Andrew Denny, Mi'kmaq Grand Council of the Mi'kmaq Grand Council, Mi'kmaq uh, Grand Council members, uh, a special welcome to National Chief uh, Sean Atlio, co-chairs of the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, Chief Terence Paul and Chief Gerard Julian, Mi'kmaq Chiefs, Council members, Elders, and Mi'kmaq community members. I'm also pleased to welcome Her Honour, the Honourable Mayan E. Francis, the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, Regional Chief Morley Gugu, Assembly of First Nations, Ian Gray, who we just uh, heard from, the Regional Director for Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada, Justice Murray Sinclair, the Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Scott Haldane, Chair of the National Panel on, the First, on First Nation Elementary and Secondary Education, of course, the Honourable Gordy Goss, Speaker of the House, Ernest Walker, Acting Deputy Minister, Office of Aboriginal Affairs, Brian Skabar, MLA for Cumberland North, and my Ministerial Assistant for Aboriginal Affairs, members of the Legislature, my colleagues from the Executive Council. I have the honour not only of being Premier, but Nova Scotia's Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. This is a post that I value greatly. The historic this historic anniversary gives us a unique opportunity to reflect upon our past, present, and future journey together. When I look back over the past few decades, I have seen so many important milestones for the Mi'kmaq and non-Mi'kmaq Nova Scotians. We have made considerable progress on how we work together from a cultural perspective and how we do business and set policy. We have made important, important strides in reconciliation, in collaboration, and in partnership. For instance, all Nova Scotians owe a deep debt of gratitude to the late Donald Marshall Jr. for his quiet struggle to make this province a better place for the Mi'kmaq. More than a dec decade ago, we witnessed the Supreme Court of Canada bring down the historic Marshall decision. And as we have all come to realize, that decision was a significant milestone in establishing the existence of Mi'kmaq treaty rights. It confirmed the Mi'kmaq's right to hunt, fish, and gather in order to earn a moderate livelihood. Junior Marshall left such a legacy. The Royal Commission on the Donald Marshall Jr. prosecution and the 1999 Supreme Court decision forever changed Nova Scotia for the better. It is now two decades since the release of the Royal Commission report. And that report and its recommendations have shaped the work of the provincial government and led to a dramatic change 
in Nova Scotia's relationship with the Mi'kmaq over the past 20 years. The recommendation that called for a tripartite forum on native issues has, has evolved into what is now a robust government-to-government -government relationship. The cornerstones of this relationship are the Mi'kmaq, Canada, Nova Scotia Tripartite Forum, and the main in Nova Scotia negotiation process and the consultation terms of reference. The Tripartite Forum lets the Mi'kmaq, the province, and the federal government address issues of common concern in a manner based on mutual respect, partnership, and commitment. We are working to close the gap in social and economic circumstances between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Members of the Tripartite Forum are dedicated to improving the lives of the Mi'kmaq and rec recognizing the contributions the Mi'kmaq bring to the province. The Tripartite Forum's seven working committees have already achieved concrete results, like increasing physical activity levels for Mi'kmaq youth encouraging economic development in communities. Other provinces and territories are watching this process and are beginning to copy it. Recently, we made significant strides in implementing a common framework for our approach to consultation. The signing of the consultation terms of reference was a historic milestone in the advancement of Mi'kmaq and Nova Scotia government relations. The Marshall Inquiry also led to the introduction of a community-based approach to Mi'kmaq justice programs. The Mi'kmaq Legal Support Network is working to protect the rights of Aboriginal people in order to avoid future wrongful convictions. The network is a national leader in Aboriginal justice, developing and implementing culturally appropriate justice projects and programs. More and more, we are working together at a government-to-government -government level. I'm pleased to see the emergence of a respectful relationship between the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs and the Government of Nova Scotia. Our annual joint meeting of the Assembly and my provincial cabinet is symbolic of this relationship. Cabinet ministers and chiefs also meet individually on many significant issues. I'm also aware of the significant steps toward a one-government approach to Mi'kmaq nationhood. The province also supports the interest in establishing a Mi'kmaq House of Assembly in Halifax. As Premier and Minister, I commit to continuing to work closely on common priorities. Priorities like the historic health data sharing agreement, the first of its kind in Canada. Together, it will help us better understand the health and social factors affecting the Mi'kmaq in Cape Breton. The province is also supporting the Mi'kmaq Major Resource Energy Fund and the Mi'kmaq Renewable Energy Strategy, which will create a foundation for future economic opportunity for the Mi'kmaq in the renewable energy sector. The youngest and fastest growing segment of our population is Mi'kmaq youth. We are committed to working together to see that they have the supports they need to succeed and play a stronger role in building a vibrant provincial economy. The province has helped create a coordinated apprenticeship and trade strategy to increase awareness of apprenticeship, bolster apprenticeship program completion, and ultimately ensure that more young people find good jobs here. The province is also working with the Unamagi Economic Benefits Office to enhance procurement opportunities for the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia and I could go on, but I also recognize that there is more work to do. The province will continue to highlight the achievements of outstanding Mi'kmaq individuals because they inspire us to be better citizens. And Treaty Day is the perfect opportunity to shine a spotlight on outstanding Mi'kmaq community leaders. My heartfelt congratulations to all of this year's Treaty Day award winners. Before the awards are actually presented, I'd like to take the opportunity to personally recognize eight individuals who are receiving one of the three awards or scholarships. First, the Donald Marshall Senior Memorial Scholarship Fund Award is presented to Aboriginal youth who excel in academics and contribute to their community. This year's Grand Chief Donald Marshall Scholarship Award recipients are Star Sock and Chastity Muse. 
The Chief Noel Doucette Memorial Youth Award is awarded to an individual or individuals nominated for their educational achievements as well as their contributions to their communities. This year, the Chief Noel Doucette Memorial Youth Achievement Award recipients are Blaine Murray of Boat Ledeck First Nation and John Sam Julian of Wakeabaugh First Nation. The Grand Chief Donald Marshall Senior Memorial Award is presented to an individual or individuals nominated by the Aboriginal community for their contributions to their communities over their lifetimes. The recipients are chosen from the nominees by the Treaty Day Committee. This year, the Grand Chief Donald Marshall Senior Elder Achievement Award goes to Reginald Maloney of Indian Brook First Nation. Katie McEwen of the Member Two First Nation, Alistair Marshall of Boat Ledeck First Nation, and Viola Robinson of the Acadian First Nation. Congratulations. Let's extend a round of applause to these outstanding individuals. We will present you with your award shortly. At the end of October, we will welcome residential school survivors from throughout Atlantic Canada to Halifax for the Atlantic National Event of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. I commend the federal government for their commitment to paving the way to reconciliation and a greater understanding of this period of our shared history. The province is honored to be involved in this historic event. In closing, I believe good progress has been made over the past quarter of a century. Much remains to be done, but we have the will and the ability to do it and a growing history of achievement to encourage us. The province's vision is one of a healthy and prosperous Nova Scotia for all families, youth and elders. I invite you to share that vision. We must work together to achieve it. Please join us in the lobby following this cer ceremony to enjoy some refresh refreshments and, and view the Mi'kmaq cultural exhibit. I'm proud to say that it was just installed as part of the House of Assembly's permanent collection. And I must expand, extend special thanks to the Nova Scotia Museum Collections team led by Roger Lewis for their work on it. On behalf of the province of Nova Scotia, I wish everyone an enjoyable Treaty Day celebration. Wallalio. Thank you, Premier. I now call upon Her Honour, the Honourable Man E. Francis, Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, to provide remarks. Grand Chief Sillaboy and Grand Council members, National Chief Italio, Chiefs, Regional Chief Gugu, Councillors and Elders, Premier Dexter, Speaker, members of the Legislative Assembly, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, and I must not forget our elders. As the Queen's representative in Nova Scotia, I am honored to join with you in celebrating Treaty Day. Our gathering here is made all the more significant by our presence in this historic chamber. It gives me great pleasure to participate in this 25th anniversary celebration, which marks a historic milestone in our province. The spirit of this day, celebrating peaceful and harmonious relations between neighbors, is a spirit we must keep alive each and every day of the year. It is important to recognize such observances, to draw attention to the occasion, so that all Nova Scotians may pause and reflect on its cultural and historical significance. As we work together to build a prosperous and peaceful future, let us work in the spirit of the treaty of 1752, cherishing good harmony and mutual correspondence. These are words we can all live by and take forward in our interactions with 
one another. Leonio. Thank you, Your Honor. I now call upon National Chief Sean Atlio to provide remarks. Chu Siyak Sa Inchat, Tistak Shit, Ahoset, A Tikshil Sisi Hat, Hatwe Hiksu, Megama, Ma Chinapsik, Ma Tikitsu, Tleko Itsu, Shnismas. I am A Inchat. In my language, just beginning by expressing my deepest of appreciation for being here in Mi'kmaq territory on what has emerged as a beautiful day, the rain abating at the appropriate moment. Mr. Premier, I, I am uh, so grateful as well for your leadership. I must share with the people of no Nova Scotia, the chiefs, that when the Premier and I have the opportunity to meet amongst his colleagues, that he is always expressing his support we know, all of us, that we have, as Her Honour has described, we have all inherited an important obligation. Your participation, Your Honour, is so critical to all of our people as a representative of the Queen. That enduring relationship that for somebody like me who comes from the far west coast, we look out here and we see that you have something that is so precious, so powerful in your treaty. To be invited here, Grand Chief, Grand Captain, to be amongst your leaders, to represent the First Nations from coast to coast to coast, to say that we are here with you. We stand with you to express our support. I'm particularly grateful to be a witness to the honoring of individuals who've provided inspiration and leadership amongst your people. And that the young people can then see their nation, Tlawa East, that they would say in my language, showing those who have held up the honor and the spirit and intent of the treaty relationship. It is indeed a great privilege to be here amongst you. The future of the Mi'kmaq Nation looks very bright. I wish to continue to express my strong support along with my colleague, Regional Chief Morley Gugu, that we will do our utmost to stand by and with you as we continue to build strong relationships. Mr. Premier, we know that we have much, much work to do ahead of us. We can't accomplish what it is that the ancestor had expressed, the vision and the treaties, living together in mutual respect, mutual recognition, in harmony, to ensure that our languages will once again flourish, that the ceremonies will be done on the territories where we come from. Then it is that Canada will be able to stand up and say, a strong First Nations and a strong Mi'kmaq nation makes for a strong Canada. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank, thank you, Natural, uh, National Chief. I now call upon Gerald Gerard Julian to provide his remarks. What is going to be? Well, that's going to be a lovely thing. This cool. You know, Sam, Gerard Julian, back in Kill. I hold that, yeah. Wow, you like. Well, I let. I'm gonna see you on the other Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Elders, Premier Dexter, National Chief Sean, uh, honored guests, and people from the communities. Chief Paul, Paul and I, on behalf of the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, are honored to provide some remarks on this historic event. Today marks the 25th anniversary of Treaty Day, being publicly celebrated and recognized in the province. It was proclaimed by the late Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. Part of his proclamation states, throughout the seasons, the treaties have remained. Like our treaties, the Mi'kmaq have also remained on this land. Our continued presence speaks to a unique and special relationship that we share with our lands and resources. It is this relationship that is embedded in the spirit and the intent of our treaties. 
as Mi'kmaq, we have our own interpretation of our treaties and treaty relationship. A treaty is much more than words on a document. It represents the culture, values, and traditions of two nations that signed it. Our treaties are our truth. It is a commitment to a lasting relationship through a framework of peace and friendship. Treaties recognize our government-to-government, nation-to-nation relationship. They are about securing our relationship to the resources and to each other with trust and respect. We are all treaty people. Our treaty relationship has been evolving over, over 286 years, and throughout this period, we have learned much. We have learned that we must continue to assert our rights because no one else can stand up for our rights. We must stand up for our rights as Mi'kmaq people. Within the past 25 years, a number of court decisions recognized our Aboriginal treaty rights. These decisions forced levels of government to begin negotiations on implementation of our Aboriginal and treaty rights. In 2002, the Maiden Nova Scotia process recreated to address our common issues with government. While we have made progress in our negotiations, we need to get more tangible results from these discussions. There is a need for the Mi'kmaq to receive a fair share in benefits derived from our lands and resources. We need to establish resource and revenue sharing agreements that can provide much needed jobs and improve services in our communities. We learned that much of our success in negotiations depends on what takes place internally within the Mi'kmaq nation. We must be united in our efforts. We must tear down walls that separate us along geographic and organizational lines. We must focus on who we are and our true purpose. No matter where we come from or who we work for, we are still Mi'kmaq. At our very core, we are one. We are connected through our shared dream of a better life for all our people. Chief Robinson once spoke of our unique position in our negotiations. She said that, and I quote, we are at a place like none other. We are on the brink to creating something great. We are on the doorstep and knocking on the door of possibilities. Possibilities of not what we can become, but what we must become, end of quote. Now is the time, more than ever before, we must continue to believe in ourselves and have trust in each other. Our power, our strength begins with us. They are not dependent on government decision or a change in political leadership. Our power comes from the inspiration and our belief in possibilities. Too often we hear that we must face reality. I say that we must create the reality that we want to see. We owe it to our future generations, but most importantly, we owe it to ourselves. Another thing that we have learned in our discussions is the necessity for Mi'kmaq to become united under the Mi'kmaq governance structure. We must create a governance structure that is on par with the federal and provincial government. We can't look to government to give our nation substance and meaning. We can't depend on anyone than ourselves. Governance creates power and the ability for the Mi'kmaq to structure how we operate as a people, as a nation. Today I ask that you think of a response to the question, what is our nation's dream? We have a shared dream of Mi'kmaq nationhood. Although we might not have all the answers, we can believe that when we come together as one, we come more than what we were before. We are much more than a status card. We are much more than the Indian Act. We are people who have come full circle. Not, from, not far from here, we are working on our, our dream of Mi'kmaq nationhood. A site has been selected to establish the Mi'kmaq House of Assembly. This building will house our own governance structure, which is currently being developed. Although our success will depend on the active involvement and support of many communities, groups, and organizations throughout our nation. The Assembly is committed to making 
it a reality. We are committed to creating a governance structure that will represent our values, our customs, and our traditions. Many of our people that can make this vision a reality, we have our elders, artists, academics, scientists, traditionalists, women, and our youth. We have honor, stories, legends, and last but not least, we have pride. Let our Mi'kmaq pride be like the torch that never goes out. A torch that's brighter and brighter with each successive generation of Mi'kmaq. Let our vision of Mi'kmaq pride become our story. A story that reflects the dreams of our ancestors and the will of our Mi'kmaq youth. Like the beat of a drum, let our nation pride resonate throughout our entire nation. Let it represent the heartbeat of our nation's spirit. Alaliyo, thank you. Thank you, Chief Julian. I now call upon Chief Terry Paul to provide remarks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, through you, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Lieutenant Governor, the Premier, the National Chief, the Grand Chief, the Grand Captain, the Grand Council, the other Chiefs, distinguished guests, and the people in the audience. First, I would like to say good afternoon. With my friend and colleague, Chief Julian, it is an honor for me to offer my insights and observations to those gathered here today in commemoration of this important day. Treaty Day is a source of great pride for the Mi'kmaq. It is also an important opportunity each year to educate and to instill pride and understanding in all Nova Scotians and in Canadians generally. The recent observance of Treaty Day was first proclaimed October 1st, 1986 by the late Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. His purpose was to commemorate the unique and special relationship between the Mi'kmaq and Her Majesty. We recognize and celebrate Treaty Day and the significance it, in, its, in its evolution of the understanding and affirmation of our people's history, their sacrifices, and more importantly, our inalienable rights. Today is truly a cause for celebration, that it is a day of reflection. It is a day that has allowed us as a people to mark progress, to gauge how far we have come. It's a day, it is a day that inevitably causes us to consider our future and the future of our children and youth. Today, I want to speak to three key themes important to the Mi'kmaq Nation, and these are, first, a reflection of the progress that we have made in the recent past and its impact in helping advance the interest of our people. Second, the opportunities and challenges that we face. And the third, the hopes and dreams of our people for the future and what that should mean to both the Mi'kmaq Nation and all Nova Scotians. On the matter of recent progress, like the snowball that grows as it rolls down the hill, the past several decades have been a very productive period. The recognition and celebration of Treaty Day itself arises from the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in 1985, which upheld the validity of the treaties our forefathers established with the Europeans, including the Treaty of 1752. Since 1985, we have also seen other milestone, milestone court decisions and the establishment of jurisprudence on matters of importance to our people. 
to Aboriginal rights and to our future success. And I know that I speak for all my brothers and sisters and for the elders of the Mi'kmaq Nation when I point to our collective pride in the Marshall decision and what it has meant to our people. Most often, negotiations are frustratingly slow and complex. However, over the last number of years, we have made gains in respect to our rights to our traditional lands and resources. Enshrining the importance of the duty to consult was another milestone victory for our people. It has allowed us to open up new economic development and business initiatives in First Nation communities and allowed us to forge constructive new business relationships with non-Aboriginal companies. Earlier, Chief Julian provided his, provided his thoughts and observations on how far we have come. He spoke of our movement from the courts to negotiations through our Made in Nova Scotia process, which we call Maugulus Juan Willemu. We have been successful in getting the province to provide funds to, a, to a set aside lands for the Mi'kmaq. We have gotten financial commitments to establish a Mi'kmaq House of Assembly and established a Mi'kmaq strategy on renewable energy. These are just some of the successes that have been achieved. While it has been a long road for our people with many sacrifices, the past several decades have, notwithstanding, also been a very productive period for our people. There is no question that our people still face many, many challenges. Poverty hinders opportunity, and it continues to persist in our communities. Poor education often condemns young people to a life of missed opportunity. And while we are seeing significant improvements in educational outcomes for our young people, this must be our unrelenting focus. While notable progress has been made, there is no question, there is no question that racism is still a factor in some quarters. At recent events in the last couple of weeks, and I know we've had experienced this ever since the Marshall decision, but recent events in Bordeleg and in Sydney Harbor will attest there are still some in the broader community that fail to understand Mi'kmaq rights, that we were the original founders of this country and that we became a dispossessed people as a result of our land being taken away from us. As a people, we also must look inward and assess our own challenges and, in some cases, our own shortcomings. There are clear lessons to be learned and we need to take these lessons to heart and use them as the fulcrum for future change. One clear challenge is the need to develop our own institutions of Mi'kmaq governance. This is, a fundament, this is of fundamental importance for our future success as a people and as a nation. It is ultimately through economic de development that many of these present day challenges can be effectively addressed. For First Nations though, for Mi'kmaq, that is often easier, than, often easier said than done. Securing funds to invest is difficult, especially within the constraints of the Indian Act. First Nations face challenges in season, season economic development opportunities, and most of the time, they leave the dock without us. There is much to be done in improving the lives of our people, 
and there are many challenges in enhancing a broader understanding of our rights. We have an inherent right to self-government. It flows from the fact that long before the arrival of the Europeans, the Mi'kmaq people were an independent nation governed by our own customs, values, and traditions. We must commit to advancing the objective of self-government. An, op an overpowering vision of many in the Mi'kmaq nation is to imagine a time when our people are no longer considered wards of the state, a time when our rights are fully restored, a time when we make our own way without the imposition of the views and institutions of those outside our community. To quote Chief Robinson, when we begin to connect as a Mi'kmaq, our hearts become our nation's spirit. The Mi'kmaq spirit, like our treaties, represents an unbreakable chain. Our honor song reinforces that view and reminds us that when we come together and connect on a spiritual level, something takes place that is transformative and that is truly incredible. The beat of the drum reminds us of, reminds us of the heartbeat of our nation. The smell of sweet grass enlivens our senses to, to the gifts that the Creator has given us. Our destiny is like a story that must be experienced and taught to future generations. We have to shape our future to tell our story and how we want things to be, and we need the resolve, the steadfastness, and the strength of character to make that future happen. We must define the future we aspire to achieve through the power of our belief and imagination. Earlier, Chief Julian mentioned our overriding interest in creating a Mi'kmaq House of Assembly. This is ultimately the instrument through which this vision for our future will be achieved. To achieve this will require the full involvement of our nation, our elders, our youth, and all Mi'kmaq. In considering the possibilities such an institution would create for our people. I am reminded of the beautiful vision articulated by the regional chief, Morley Gugu, on the power of the vision of a Mi'kmaq House of Assembly. Chief Gugu observed the following. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to imagine a place that is not that far off in the distant future. You walk into a building that from, that from the moment you walk in represents all that is Mi'kmaq. Imagine the paint, the designs, and the artwork. You smell sweet grass. We start to hear the drumming of the Mi'kmaq honor song. Its drum, its drum beat sends chills down your spine. You look at familiar faces that in some way seem different. You realize that it is the look of pride and honor. You begin to smile, shake your head and say to yourself, I never could have imagined. It is that vision so compellingly formulated by Regional Chief Google that must be our inspiration. And as we measure progress, from year to year during Treaty Day. It is that vision that must be foremost in our minds. Its achievement will mean that we have restored our place as the founding people of this great country that we all embrace with the same level of enthusiasm reserved for our own sacred Mi'kmaq nation. Well, Aliyo. Thank you, Chief Paul. I now call upon the Mi'kmaq 
Ground Counsel Captain Andrew Denny to provide remarks. Well, I'll in uh, Edlow Studio. Uh, in my language, that's Mr. Speaker, one that's speaking. And uh, I don't think the na na natural chief is natural. I think I'm the one that's natural, Mr. Speaker. But Gurloya and Ejugul Dagishka, I wish I wish to. Gurlin Kiga, this is Amau. Premier Dexter, National Chief, Sakamak, Mr. Gray, Honorable Mayan Francis, then Governor. I am the Danish sport to you. Imagine you all the dignitaries. Well, that's a busy day. I'm glad you're here taking part in three day celebrations. Uh, I have to um, introduce a, a fellow to you before I start my speech. And this fellow comes, comes from a very long line from a her hereditary, I don't call them chiefs. In Mi'kmaq, we didn't have chiefs, we had Sakamak. But this particular individual, I forget how old he is, but the thing is, he is the new Buddhus of the Mi'kmaq Nation, part of our executive, and his name is Victor Ellick. Victor, as I mentioned, when you look at the history of our Grand Council, of our government, his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, you know, they were the wampum keepers of our nation. You know, and when it comes to a time when we look at our future, you know, and I'm going to start my speech pretty soon, but when you look at our future, you know, it's very important that we, as a government, a traditional government of the Mi'kmaq, from the seven districts in Mi'kmaq, are able to reconcile with his old man and give him his proper place in our government. You know, it was very important when you look at the reconciliation process of the Mi'kmaq. A, a simple, I'm sorry, is not our way. There was a process that must be, you know, that must be uh, accounted for. And uh, I congratulate Mr. Mr. Ellick on his uh, being appointed vidus to follow in his father's footsteps. You know, it's very important for us and our people as we move forward. It seems like every time we speak, you know, the government will tell us, no, you didn't do that. Your professors, your historians will always take us to court and say, no, that's not what our historians say. You know, you're not Mi'kmaq. I think the chiefs pointed it out earlier, you know, the treaties have a special and different meaning to us. And I'm just uh, proud to recognize Mr. Relic today. You know, there was a time when we met on Treaty Day and this council chamber will, would be full of our captains, you know, our government. We are not going anywhere. You know, and we are going to fight for our people. And this is the one thing I have to say before I start. Um, <laughs> No. 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 I'm just so proud to be here, but as I, as I mentioned, you know, as I stand before you today, I always think back, is, you know, I think back about time, is 25 years enough? You know, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of Treaty Day in Halifax, and while I rejoice with many of you, I ask myself, has 25 years been enough? We as Mi'kmaq continue to, to honor Article 6 of the 1752 Treaty. This treaty, recognized and affirmed by the Constitution of Canada and highlighted by the historic Simon case, that states that we shall meet in Halifax to renew our treaty relationship with the British sovereign every year in October. I was in uh, Wegobach not too long ago, celebrating with the young people at the school. 
And I had asked him why we come to Halifax. You see? We came to Halifax for a reason. And I will mention that. But the young people were very interested in learning about why we come to Halifax each year. For now, 25 years, as Mi'kmaq, we have danced, prayed, marched, and proclaimed our treaty relationship every year. In reflecting on Treaty Day, while there's a great deal of pride, hope, and determination, we as Mi'kmaq should celebrate. You know, I stand before you as my father did before me and ask, how many years will it take for the spirit and intent of our treaties to be implemented? How many more years shall I stand before various governments and ask for a true treaty partnership, a sincere treaty reconciliation process, and a trustworthy relationship based on the fulfillment of the treaty obligation and an end to Mi'kmaq poverty? In my short time as Grand Captain, I have observed the negotiations between Mi'kmaq chiefs and the colonial governments. And I my state, a better treaty partnership is needed. A true treaty relationship and treaty reconciliation is not one where one partner tells the other what they will and will not discuss. We must leave behind paternal regimes based on racism and improve on a process where the government may not add clauses like own source revenue and then say, take it or leave it. These approaches do not respect our historic constitutional relationship and does not uphold the honor of the Crown as mandated by your courts. As Grand Captain, I have continued to meet with the chiefs and hear about the cuts to the, to the social programs or compliance with social assistance regulations as governments have referred to. If you have not already heard, let me tell you today. It, peer, it appears that the poor will get poorer in the months to come. And the Mi'kmaq leaders will be forced to choose between the use of banned monies to allow community members to continue to manage their poverty, or to use dollars that are desperately needed for education or economic development. These are to provide for those who already have so little. In reflection, our past relationship, I have the point that it wasn't until 1929 when the government and courts in Nova Scotia deprived Mi'kmaq of their livelihood, their government, and the treaties in the Silliboy case. From that point on, our subsistence became dependent on government handouts to survive. I also must remind you that up until 1960s, any Mi'kmaq who, cho who chose to seek higher learning through a university education was no longer considered an Indian, a Mi'kmaq. So let's recap. Our rights were taken out from us. Our original government replaced. We were unable to access education, to become lawyers, doctors. We were centralized onto reserves away from major economic areas. And now only a generation or two later, the plan is to cut funding on the dependency you created? As your grand captain, I can't help but think of my father's words, fool's gold. For, de for decades, we have seen to lose sight of traditional ways of life and have instead relied on the mercy of government to continue these fool's goals payments. As a member of the Grand Council, I can say that for years we have been skeptical of the promise for money, promise of money for nothing, and have demanded nothing less than treaty implementation and the resource sharing. But I will not stand in front of you today asking government to rethink cuts to social. Instead, I say this, take it all. Take your fool's gold. Take your government handout. But only when you return all that we have not relinquished or ceded in our treaties. After reading the treaties, you will realize that we have never ceded the land 
the resources, the water, or any of the minerals, minerals that lay beneath us. Surely, the amount taken from Mi'kmaq resources is far greater than any government program has offered us in the past. This blunt talk of treaty implementation and treaty resource sharing scare many of us. For some of us, it is seen as the pie in the sky or as unreachable. For those people, I would remind them that it was only 40 years ago that the treaties we come to celebrate were not seen to be worth the paper that they were written on, according to the legal community, and even the leadership of Mi'kmaq and non Mi'kmaq of that time. It was only through whispers of dreams did we ever contemplate that we would have our treaties recognized in the Constitution or that we would have victories in the su Supreme Court validating these treaty rights, but that we would wait for 25 years to meet here in the province house with leaders of all governments and reaffirm these treaties. So I, I asked my fellow Mi'kmaq, both young and old, to dream, to believe, to be determined to take nothing less than what our ancestors guaranteed in signing these nation-to-nation -nation treaties and all the rights and resources that go with them. I would like to conclude my remarks today in the acknowledgement of 25 years of Treaty Day celebrations and our goal of, for the fulfillment of treaty obligations and rights. For many of us leaders, we often focus on the political nature of Treaty Day. And as Mi'kmaq, we are the only nation that has a day of political action where we can address leaders of provincial and federal governments annually. However, it is, while it is always important to recognize Treaty Day about the political issues and actions, we must never forget that it is an occasion to celebrate family and friendships as well. It is truly a wonderful thing that as Mi'kmaq, many families come to, to celebrate Treaty Day and that we honor those among us who are deserving. As I once was a young man hearing my father's words on Treaty Day, as well as seeing respected leaders and elders take part in this celebration, it makes me proud to see that we continue to honor our parents. We continue to honor our grandparents and ancestors by once again coming here to honor these promises that were made so many years ago. We continue to share in the laughter. We continue to share our teachings and our history. And we continue to hope and pray for a better tomorrow for generations to come. Looking around the room, I can't help but notice and maybe reminisce about 25 years of Treaty Day. In the past, I have been a little criticized from the fact that my speeches have been a bit long. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I told the Treaty Day Committee, you know, we do not come here just for the cultural aspect. We come here as a nation to honor Article 6 of our treaty. That's also to make submissions on what we don't like what has been happening to us? What needs to be changed? I look around and I see families when I was a young boy that brought their kids here. These children are now grown. They have their own families. This is the Mi'kmaq aspect, the culture of why we come here. I see Reggie, who's getting an award today. I see her daughters, her grandchildren, his grandchildren here. You know, many people, PJ, John Paul, you know, Ayan Patsy, Jean Knockwood. You know, so many people that were still at the World Trade and Convention Center that could not join us. I reflect on, and I don't know if I should say this, but Dr. Granny and uh, the late Bidu's Charlie Herney talking in Mi'kmaq. And only Mi'kmaq can understand when they start talking about stuff when they were young. You know, most of us don't want to hear it, but the thing is, the laughter that they 
You know, they gave, you know, when you hear them talking about their old days, or, or their young days, we should, we should say. They are no longer here today. Their relatives, the people that they left behind are still here celebrating that. You know, it's important for us to understand why we come here. In, in my final words today, I would like to thank all those who took the time out of their short lives to celebrate Treaty Day. For those who brought their children, for those who brought their elderly parents, for those who remain committed to the idea that the dream that Mi'kmaq treaties will be implemented, the, ho the hope that these treaties will, we celebrate will lead us out of poverty and despair and into prosperity. The, the, the determination for the 25 years we have stood up and let government know that we will not go away, that we will not go quietly into the night, that we will persevere and that we are prepared to fight. And if it takes another 25 years, you can be sure that as Mi'kmaq, proud, determined, resilient, we are here for the long haul. And believe me, we are just getting warmed up. I have to get something off my chest. You know, I, I don't know if that was enough, but the thing is, when the Queen visited us last year, we were so honored. But, you know, it's hard as a Mi'kmaq, as a nation, and you're always begging for handouts to have celebrations. You know, that's why we need that re re revenue sharing, that resource sharing. You know, but I met this old man who was a Holocaust survivor. And we started talking. And he explained to me everything about the Holocaust. And, you know, of course, we all knew what happened. We all remember our smogonies. But I mentioned to him, sir, we know what happened to you. Mi'kmaq men went there. Mi'kmaq went overseas to help you to liberate you. It wasn't because that we were Canadians, it was because that we were Mi'kmaq to help the fellow human beings of this world. And I reminded him of all the people that came into our territory from Pier 21 here in Halifax. It just so happens, as I was heading home to my hotel, I was picked up in a, in a taxi cab by a uh, you know, I think a young, young man from Iraq, or, or Iran, who put down the queen, put down myself, you know, put down our country. And I told him, if you don't like it here, why do you stay? You know, why are you here? But the fact is, this is what I told him. I don't know if he went back or not. But this old man that I talked to, when he, Her Excellency Queen Elizabeth came, I reminded him, sir, and I don't want to be disrespectful, it's not my culture, but when are all the people that came on Pier 21 from all the nations of the world help us? When are they going to stand up for us when Mi'kmaq boats are being capsized, when we cannot use our resources? When you look at Israel, you know, today in Palestine, you know, and what happened in the UN General Assembly the other day. When my father went before the UN some 30 years ago, Canada declared him a terrorist because he was trying to do better for his people. When are the United Nations going to come and help us if it means putting sanctions on Canada, you know, if it means them paying duty when their freighters come into our, our waters. We do have a long way to go. You know, I have to thank Premier Dexter, the former premiers, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Savage, Mr. Ham, you know, you know, and the Lieutenant Governors. It is important that we remember what we've been through for the last 25 years as we move forward because we cannot keep going the way we are going. You know, the world 
has to come and help the Mi'kmaq as the other nations of this land. You know, it is very vital to our economy. You know. When you look at the global recession, you know, Mi'kmaq didn't have a recession. You know. Most of our people are on welfare. You know. And when you look at the province, you know, it was last year or the year before when they wanted 7,000 new immigrants to come into Nova Scotia to fill jobs. You know, we have 7,000 Mi'kmaq on reserves that could fill those jobs if they were trained. You know? <laughs> when I look back on Treaty Day and I see my father you know, and I hear him, and I remember the very last speech he ever gave and reflecting on these Treaty Day, I was going through his notes of the past 25 or 20, at least, I think he was here for 20 treaty days in his speeches. You know? And it seemed like, it was like the old 45 records when they were scratched. You know? They would play over and over again. You know? It is important to the Grand Council, the true government of the Mi'kmaq, you know, of the seven districts, that we continue to help our chiefs and unite all of our people so that we can move forward. You know, today, kids, when I asked them in Wigorbach, you know, what was Treaty Day about, they couldn't understand why it was only Mi'kmaq schools and Mi'kmaq communities that had a holiday when the rest of Nova Scotia went on about their business instead of learning. You know, You know, it's important that as we move forward, that we learn and help each other. That is what friendship is all about. Well, all you. Thank you, Grand Captain Denny. And now, it's now my great pleasure to commence the awards presentation component of this event by introducing the winners of the Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. Elder Achievement Awards. Today, we recognize four people who have brought honor and a lifetime of service to their communities. Since 1993, the Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. Memorial Elder Award has been presented to an individual or individuals nominated by the Aboriginal community for their contributions to their communities over their lifetimes. The recipients are chosen by the nominees by the Treaty Day Committee. Today's first recipient is Order of Nova Scotia recipient Viola Robinson, a trusted and expiring leader to the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia. From the 1970s, she worked to end discrimination against Mi'kmaq people, advocating in particular for changes to sections of the Indian Act that discriminated against Aboriginal women. She served as president of the Nova Scotia Native Council of Nova Scotia from 1975 to 1990, and as president of the Native Council of Canada since 1990 and 1991. She was one of seven commissioners who traveled across Canada with the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in the early 1990s. She received an honorary doctorate of laws from Dalhousie University and went on to study law, graduating with a law degree in 1978. She contributed to the Made in Nova Scotia process and helped to establish the Royal Native, Native Housing Program and the Courts Workers Program and the Mi'kmaq Legal Support Network. Today, is she, she is land claim negotiator for the Acadia First Nations, a member of the National Board of Aboriginal Healing Foundation, and a senior advisor to the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. She continues to bring wisdom, pers perseverance, and vision to achieving a just and inclusive society for her people. 
I would now ask Premier Daryl Dexter and Josephine Laporte to come forward to present the Grand Chief Donald Marceau Sr. Memorial Elder Award to Viola Robinson. Thank you. The second recipient of the Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. Memorial Elder Award is Captain Reginald Maloney. Maloney. Of Indian Brook. Of Indian Brook First Nation. A tireless supporter and advocate for Mi'kmaq treaty rights, he was chief of the Indian Brook First Nation for 26 years and also served as Union of Nova Scotia Indians District Chief. During this period, he remained unwaveringly committed to supporting treaty rights issues and educating others of the importance and significance of these rights. He is currently a captain with the Grand Council and is also Indian Brook First Nation Band Counselor. Captain Maloney comes from a long line of Mi'kmaq chiefs and other leaders within the Indian Brook community whose political contribution extends more than 155 years. Captain Maloney has worked diligently for the well-being of the Mi'kmaq community. He has served as coach to many, guiding and motivating and inspiring them. I would now invite Reginald Maloney to come forward and receive his award. Thank you. The third recipient of the Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. Memorial Elder Award is De Alistair Marshall of Bodledeck First Nation. Alistair has provided leadership on a variety of environmental issues, locally, provincially, and nationally. And he is dedicated to protecting the natural world around us and improving its overall health. He is a guard guardian of our fisheries, dedicating much of his time to promoting conservation and protecting our oceans. In 1992, he became involved with Nova Scotia Environmental Network and helped form the Save the Oce Our Seas and Shores Coalition. He is also involved in the First Nation Natural, National Environmental Network and has joined numerous other environmental initiatives that aim to protect and preserve our environment. He is also a member of the Elder Circle of the Unimogi Institute of Natural Resources. Bodletech is proud of Alistair's passion for the environment and his commitment to making a difference. Mr. Marshall, please come forward and accept your award.
Thank you. The fourth recipient of the Grand Chief Donald Marshall Senior Memorial Elder Award is Katie McCune. Katie is a residential school survivor and has worked very hard to find personal peace, growth and acceptance through the teaching of her ancestors and her elders. Following graduation, she worked for many years in a variety of roles as hairdressing, waitressing and early childhood education. During this period, she recognized the personal satisfaction she experienced from helping others in her community. At the age of 50, this passion led her to receive a Bachelor of Community Studies degree from Cape Breton University and a Master's of Social Work at Carleton University, where she fought for the right to present her theses in Mi'kmaq. Afterwards, she returned to her community where she worked for a number of member to social service organizations, including its social work department. Katie is a passionate and committed supporter of her community and her culture, and she has gained a deep understanding of her history, spirituality, and language. Wherever there is a crisis in her community, Katie is often called upon to help both mentally and spiritually. Katie, we are honored to recognize you today Katie McEwen, please come forward to accept your award. Thank you. The fourth recipient of the Grand Chief Donald Marshall Senior Memorial Elder Award. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. This is another award, I guess, and I missed this one. Since 1997, um, the Chief Noel Doucette Memorial Youth Award has been presented to individuals nominated for their educational achievements as well as their contributions to their community. It is my pleasure to announce that the Chief Noel Doucette Memorial Award for 2010 will be awarded to two individuals. Our first recipient is Blaine Marie of Baudeladec First Nation. Blaine has been a community volunteer since she was 14 years old, has initiated many sports and recreational activities for children and youth in her community. She is responsible, respectful, honest, compassionate, and reliable. Currently, she is excelling in her studies at Cape Breton University and plans to attend St. Francis Xavier University education program once she completes her Bachelor of Arts degree at CBU. Her goals and dreams selflessly focus on her community, rather than her own needs. It's our hope that she will continue to inspire children and youth and to be more engaged and active in their communities. Blaine Murray, please come forward to accept your award. Thank you. The second recipient of the Chief Noel Doucette Memorial Achievement Award is 18-year-old John Sam Julian of Wegaba First Nation. He is a gifted young filmmaker who placed third in two categories at the 2010 Atlantic Film Festival. This past July, he was nominated to attend the Global Young Leaders Conference in Washington, D.C. 
which aims to enhance the leadership skills of youth. He was the only Mi'kmaq in a group of 400 students selected to attend from around the world. John Sam's big dream is to continue in the film industry and to attend the Sundance film in Utah. Despite losing his dad, John has committed to work hard and help his fellow students wherever he is able. His motto is, if you can dream, you can do it. It is what he believes in and it is how he lives his life. John Sam Julian, please come forward to accept your award. Thank you. I would now like to invite Chief Leroy Denny to introduce the Donald Marshall Seniors Scholarship Fund winners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the recipient of the Donald Marshall Senior Undergraduate Award is Chazin Muse of the Indian Brook First Nation community. Ms. Muse has achieved the goal of graduating from Cape Breton University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Mi'kmaq Studies. Her lifetime career goal is to contribute to the improvement of the health status of Aboriginal, Métis, and Inuit Canadians, and especially those children within her community. With her uh, heavy uh, workload with the school, she continues to work as an Aboriginal Student Success Advisor at the NSCC Truro Campus. Chastity is still able to find the time to continue, to continue some volunteer activities. In 2006, she walked across Canada to raise awareness of Aboriginal youth suicide. And in 2007, helped organize a across Canada bike ride for addictions and recovery. In 2010, she started an annual walk called the Medicine Trail Walk for Life, a walk for hope, and this year, the, the, the relay walk will begin in Acadia First Nation and end in Niskazonia First Nation. She's also a jingle dress dancer and has been living a alcohol and drug free lifestyle for the past six years. She's very active in sports, especially in volleyball. Ms. Muse is a single parent and lives in Indian Brook with her son, Justin, which is, which is 12 years old. This is probably the greatest uh, hardship for her and one, thing, and one that is foreign to other students in the program. She finds that her fellow students too, do not understand the demands of parenthood and the constant struggle to juggle motherhood and school. There have been many challenges for Chastity during her long road toward success, but with the continuing support of her son and extended family, she will be able to overcome these in her future education goals and help those in need.
Uh, Mr. Speaker, the next recipient for the Donald Marshall Senior Graduate Award is uh, Star Sock of the Eskizona First Nation community. Mrs. Sock has already achieved the goal of graduating from St. FX University with a Bachelor of Education degree and by May of 2012 plans to graduate with a Master's of Education in Administration. She is now in the process of completing her thesis entitled Fluency, Identity, and Student Achievement as in-depth study of the uh, immersion program in Eskazoni. She continues to teach full-time in the immersion program in Eskazoni. Her love and present quest is the Mi'kmaq immersion program, which she has been involved with since its uh, inception of the Eskazoni school. She is a uh, co-author of a research study that illustrated the benefits of the bilingual education and the benefits of the Mi'kmaq immersion program. Star is still able to find some time to volunteer at the school and with her children's sports and recreation groups. She, she also still has time to pro uh, provide meals under the Feed and Elder program in Eskazoni. She's married to a wonderful husband, Derek, and a proud parent of six children, Shay Shaylin, 15, Kwebeja, Cameron, and Mason, 12, uh, Derek Jr., nine, Susie, six, and Harry, 19 months. It is with great pride that she states that they are fluent in Mi'kmaq and English, except for uh, young Harry. <laughs> Her uh, greatest hardship is finding the time to re maintain this uh, active level of activities and still find time to go to school. She finds that with the support of her husband and her extended family, the constant struggle to juggle motherhood and school will be, will be overcome. Starr also notes that the support she has received from her co-author and friend, Cherise Paul, has been invaluable. Starr is yet an example of a strong Mi'kmaq woman who will succeed in whatever she sets out to do. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Denny. The proclamation for Mi'kmaq History Month was signed on October the 1st, 1993. In that proclamation, both the Nova Scotia government and the Mi'kmaq recognized that the peace and the friendship aspect of the treaty signed in the 1700s require a public awareness of the history, values, and the diversity of cultures. Each year, a poster is developed to commemorate this important event. This year's design highlights the 25th anniversary of Treaty Day celebrations. The Mi'kmaq Nation has lived in occupied Nova Scotia since the time of Morale. Nova Scotia is a part of the Mi'kma'ki, Mi'kmaq homeland. The Mi'kmaq lived according to the specific laws that were bestowed upon them by the Creator, laws which govern their relationship with the land, nature, and mankind. Their identity as Mi'kmaq was and continues today to be distinctly linked to this land through their culture, language, and traditions. The Mi'kmaq maintain a stewardship relationship to the land they call Mother Earth, who is the provider of substance and life. The poster represents a sampling of spiritual, spirituality and special places throughout Nova Scotia that are held in the Goose Clap legends and the Mi'kmaq oral histories, which continue to remain important to the Mi'kmaq today. I will now call upon Grand Chief Ben Salaboy and Grand Captain Andrew Dennity to come forward and unveil the Mi'kmaq History Month poster.
Thank you, Grand Chief and Grand Captain. We have now reached the part of the ceremony involving the symbolic exchange of gifts. I invite Premier Daryl Dexter, Grand Chief Ben Silliboy, and Regional Director General Ian Gray to come forward to present gifts on behalf of Nova Scotia. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our ceremony. I would now ask you to rise for the national anthem led by Miss Arlene Stevens, who will sing the anthem in Mi'kmaq. Miss Steves, I invite you to come forward. Thank you for coming today to today's ceremony. It has provided us with an important opportunity to recognize the Mi'kmaq's contribution to the province's history, culture, and economy. I invite you to stay and enjoy some refreshments in the lobby and participate in the unveiling of the Mi'kmaq exhibit. Please remain seated until after the members of the official party have exited the room. Please have a pleasant evening. The Speaker of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly grants permission to record the televised proceedings of the legislature for use in schools and for other purposes, such as private study, research, review, or newspaper summary. 
Television and radio broadcasters may make use of recorded excerpts of the televised proceedings in their news or public affairs programs for the purposes of fair and accurate reports of proceedings. Program material may not be used for political party advertising, election campaigns, or any other politically partisan activity. Any other commercial use or rebroadcast of these televised proceedings requires the express written approval of the speaker.